Okay, welcome to reading roundup number two. This should take us right through the end of the semester. Okay, here we go. Okay, our first reading that we're going to discuss is by Samuel Smiles. Uh, it's his book called Self Help. Uh, it's very famous and, and, and ultimately becomes somewhat infamous as well. It's published in 1859. And in this text, Samuel Smiles uh, is going to write really a book all about it. I mean, I suppose the title is sort of self-explanatory. He's going to write a book about people who have made it, people who uh, thrived and prospered during the Industrial Revolution, people who, uh, through their own hard work and industry, according to Smiles, succeeded in creating wealth and prosperity and uh, achievement for themselves. And his thesis, his main argument throughout all this, is that they did it through their own hard work. Um, and throughout all of his texts, not just self-help, but he writes others uh, entitled Thrift, and there are a few others as well, uh, where he really promotes the idea of individual responsibility. That if you're poor and struggling, then most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the reason is because you yourself have failed in some way. That you are being careless, that you have not uh, made the most of your opportunities. That's his general outlook. He is at the same time somewhat complicated in that he is going to critique laissez-faire policies. He's not going to have any sympathy for predatory behavior. So uh, he's not necessarily in favor of capitalism with no restraint. He complains very bitterly in various pamphlets about uh, basically people who are committing fraud and taking advantage of others and, and uh, allowing there to be pollution and contamination of water supply and, and uh, general cheating and, you know, like, you know, selling people adulterated flour and all those sorts of things uh, that's, you know, been cut with like chalk dust or something and making people sick. He doesn't have sympathy for this true laissez-faire, let anybody do what they want. He uh, believes in law and order and fairness and having some um, interventions to protect people. Uh, but at the same time, beyond that, he is going to be a strong proponent of the idea that the only person responsible for lifting you out of poverty or uh, helping you succeed is really you yourself. So that's his general background and outlook. And in his book, Self-Help, which in his own day becomes enormously a big bestseller, uh, he's going to highlight the lives and give a biography of various people who uh, have managed to, to do that. And our selection in the Kishlansky book, in my book, it's page 136, where it begins. It's the section in his book where he's talking about Josiah Wedgwood. And Wedgwood is a person who ultimately creates a very famous uh, line of fine pottery that um, is highly desired in Britain and elsewhere. You can still buy it at like Macy's, I think, uh, buy pieces of Wedgwood for like your wedding china or something. It's, it's highly desirable. It's very lovely, wonderful stuff. And Samuel Smiles writes a biography of Josiah Wedgwood in an effort to try to demonstrate how he succeeded and how he can be an example to the rest of us. And in it, there are, I'm just going to give you a couple of really quick quotes out of here to give you a sense of where he's coming from. He, you can see what his attitude is relatively clearly. The first line of our text begins, Josiah Wedgwood was one of those indefatigable men who from time to time spring from the ranks of the common people and by their energetic character not only practically educate the working population in habits of industry, but by the example of diligence and perseverance which they set before them, largely influence the public activity in all directions and contribute in a great degree to form the national character. You'll see this again and again in this text. He talks about... Um, Wedgwood is being indefatigable, indefatigable, which means tireless. He talks about his energy, he talks about his perseverance. He's going to go into this whole like little story about how Josiah Wedgwood was sick as a child and ended up losing uh, some of his uh, basic physical strength and uh, it, one of his legs, basically, he doesn't really lose the leg, but <clears throat> um, he is ends up, because of this physical disability, uh, according to Smiles, that's what turns Josiah Wedgwood into a powerhouse of intellectual innovation. And um, he makes a great deal of effort to point out that Josiah Wedgwood's success is all about industry. It's all about hard work and lifting himself up and overcoming obstacles. 
And so he's going to emphasize these uh, ideas over and over and over again. And at the same time, he's going to skim completely over the fact, I mean, he does mention it, but he skims completely over the fact that Wedgwood's family, his whole family were potters and they owned a pottery business and he got started in his family business and was trained by his family. It's not like he came out of nowhere and was like, I'll be a great potter. No, <laughs> he didn't come from nowhere. He had an established inroad into this, which one could argue is what gave him the opportunity to succeed but smiles doesn't emphasize that throughout his entire text and he talks about wedgwood and his accomplishments and then toward the end of our selection he's going to go on and on about the contributions that wedgwood has ultimately made because of this and he talks about um the quantity and value of the produce that is entitled to consideration, but also the improvement of the condition of the population by whom this great branch of industry is conducted. When Wedgwood began his labors, the Staffordshire district was only in a half civilized state. People were poor, uncultivated, and few in number. When Wedgwood's manufacture was further established, there was found employment at good wages for three times the population. Uh, men such as these are fairly entitled to take rank as industrial heroes of the civilized world. Patient self reliance amid trials and difficulties, courage and perseverance in pursuit of worthy objects are not less heroic of their kind than the bravery and devotion of the soldier and sailor whose duty and pride it is heroically to defend what these valiant leaders of industry have so heroically achieved. So it's really overblown, as you can see. Smiles goes on and on about how Wedgwood and people like him uh, succeeded through their own hard work and their, their heroes on that account. So in his own day, as I mentioned, this was quite a popular text. People really went for it. But on the flip side, um, relatively early on, even in his own day, people are going to criticize Smiles because the reality of the working class in England is that a lot of people are working very hard and still starving. They're working very hard and not in any position to profit or to get ahead or to make a name for themselves. They're in no way ever going to be a hero of industry because there's just no opportunity for that. And so critics of Smiles are going to point to this and say, you're blaming the poor for their own failure when in fact so much of it is out of their hands. Smiles is not totally unsympathetic, as I mentioned at the beginning of this. He is a critic of laissez-faire policies. He, he doesn't agree that people should be victimized. But at the same time, his writing is going to be used and held up by many, many people who politically are going to argue against providing uh, legal protection and legal support uh, for the poor. So there it is. That's where you've got that. Okay, next thing. Edwin Chadwick, uh, speaking of somebody with a slightly different perspective, this is a photograph. We're into the era of photographs. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, Edwin Chadwick is going to write his inquiry into the condition of the poor in 1842. Uh, he is a social reformer. He's very active and he is highly regarded in his own life. He's going to be invited to prepare reports and present them to Parliament a number of times. He's going to take on a bunch of issues mostly revolving around living conditions, sanitation especially. Um, he's going to take on that as well as what the topic of this reading, our reading in our Tischlansky book in 139, is really about ventilation. Uh, but it's really, broadly speaking, about working conditions for the poor. And in it, Chadwick is attempting to put together a report that would present to a layperson, a person who is not an expert, um, what life is like if you're in one of these working classes. And he's doing this with a mind to uh, directing and proposing legislation that could improve things. So his attitude is a bit different from Samuel Smiles's, as you can probably tell. Um, and so in this text, if you read through it, it's got a couple of examples. Uh, the first, he talks about bad ventilation, and this is a little bit surprising to many students. He begins his texts, 140 of my book, the evils arising from bad ventilation of places of work will probably be mostly distinctly brought to view by the consideration of the evidence as to its effects on one particular class of work people. Now, if you'd stopped there and you had to guess what class of work people are struggling the most with bad ventilation, my guess is that you would never come up with what he's about to say. I would have thought coal mines or factories or something. <clears throat> he talks about 
the frequency of cases of early deaths, orphanage, widowhood among one class of laborers, the journeyman tailors, that led me to make inquiries into the causes affecting them. This is a little bit shocking. Out of all the workers in England, you wouldn't think tailors would be particularly uh, prone to diseases of bad ventilation, but he goes on to explain what tailor workshops were like, and he interviews a couple of people and gives their names and ages, and he talks about uh, this guy, Mr. Thomas Brownlow, for instance, where he describes what it's like. And what Mr. Brownlow says <clears throat> is that he worked at uh, these various places, and in one of them, one of these workshops, they had 80 to 100 men at work, and at the other, they had 250 men at work. So you have all of these tailors working in one place. And uh, then when asked to describe what it was like and the effects of the, of the health of the people, uh, the tailor goes on to say that at Mr. Allen's, there was a room where 80 men worked together. So it was 80 people in one room, about 16 or 18 yards long, seven or eight yards wide. It's not a very big space. If I mean, you could probably, you know, block off a yard and do a some little mental math uh, in your mind. That is a lot, a lot of people crammed into a very small space. It's lighted with skylights. The men are close together, nearly knee to knee. In the summertime, the heat of the men and the heat of the irons made the room 20 or 30 degrees higher than the heat outside. The heat was then most suffocating, especially after candles were lighted. So imagine there's this room. It's relatively small. Everybody's crammed in like sardines and they're working as tailors, which means they have to have these tables in front of them with fabric all spread out on top of it. Then they've got irons. And because there's no electricity, obviously, these irons are being heated in open braziers, which means they have like a little coal like grill type area. Uh, that's coal fired and so you have like a hot it's literally made of iron you have a hot iron that's just kind of set on it to get hot so that they can then use that to um, <clears throat> iron the clothes as they're making them and so imagine the heat of this place there's no windows it's just skylights all these people crammed in together it's horrifying um, and then he describes, it goes on, that people complain of the heat and the smell is intolerable. The smell occasioned by the heat of the irons and breath to the men really was at times intolerable. They sat as loosely as they possibly could. Perspiration running from them is the heat and closeness. It is a frequent occurrence at workshops that light suits of clothes are spoiled <coughs> and men <coughs> pass right out. So what he's describing here clearly is a sweatshop. It's a place where people are working in these incredibly cramped quarters. It's very hot. There's no kind of decent ventilation. He then goes on to talk about how in the winter it's even worse because uh, people fight over whether to open a window or close a window because people next to it are cold and then the people who are not next to it are boiling up hot. And so it goes on and on. And then, <clears throat> pardon me, um, Chadwick will, goes on to quote Thomas Brownlow to describe how people coped with this. And it's an interesting side note, something worth noting that what Thomas Brown now describes is that midway through the day, well, even starting early on, <clears throat> okay, so, okay, it has a very depressing effect on the energies, and that was the general complaint of those who come into it. The natural effect of this depression was that we had recourse to drink as a stimulant. And when he says drink, he means alcoholic beverages. We went into the shop at six o'clock in the morning. At seven o'clock, when orders for breakfast were called in, gin was brought in, and the common alarm allowance was half a quarter. So he's describing people taking a half a quarter is um, it's half of a quarter. I know it sounds kind of odd, but it's half of a quarter of a pint of gin. So it's basically shots of gin. It's a couple of shots of gin. He's talking about that. So uh, and then uh, Chadwick asks. Um, was gin the first thing taken before any solid food? Yes, and breakfast was very light. Those who took gin generally only took half a pint of tea and two penny loaf as breakfast. When was the liquor again brought in at 11 o'clock? And then he describes how throughout the day, these poor men who are working in the sweatshop are just shooting back gin. And this is just an interesting kind of side note. This was one of the common prevailing problems in the 19th century in Britain. People were drinking lots of gin, and that's a relatively new thing. 
uh, this is just almost a piece of trivia, but following the French Revolution and during the era of the French Revolution, grain prices went very high. And then they stayed high because of Napoleon's continental system and various other uh, reasons that it was difficult for Britain to get as much grain as they wanted, as much grain as the demand was. And so prices of grain went way up. It was typical in Britain as elsewhere in Europe not to drink water. Uh, it was very dangerous to drink straight water because it isn't treated in any way to make it safe. And so your two real options if you wanted to drink something and not become ill was to drink tea, which was boiled, which is why it was safe, or you could drink uh, an alcoholic beverage of some kind. Either beer, in the case of England, cider, uh, is very popular in the Americas as well as in England, or in uh, on the continent uh, there was a lot of cider and a lot of wine. Um, and those were safe because in the case of like wine, you don't use water to make wine and what water you do might have gotten in there is, is neutralized by the alcohol content. Um, and the case of beer, most of the beer being uh, produced and consumed uh, in Europe is what was known as small beer. It had relatively low alcohol levels, so somewhere between 3%, 2%, 3%, something in that. And small beer is safe to drink as your beverage. Uh, you can drink it. It has enough hydration for people so that they can consume it and not die. Um, and it's also not likely to get you terribly drunk unless you just are really dedicated. So um, that was typical and people couldn't just switch over to drinking water because as I mentioned, the water is unsafe. It's full of typhus and cholera and all that kind of nasty, horrible stuff. And so when grain prices went high, 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 it was enormously difficult for beer producers to produce beer cheaply enough that people could afford to buy it because they're living on very poor wages. And that's a huge crisis because people can't drink the water. So what they turned to instead was producing distilled liquor. Beer requires grain. You have to have um, barley, wheat. Um, you can use rice if you want to. Um, Budweiser uses a fair amount of rice. Uh, but you have to have relatively high quality grain because if you use poor quality grain or spoiled grain or anything along those lines, you will taste it immediately. It will be foul. There's no way to hide it when you're talking about beer. In the case of distilled liquor, that's not the case. You can make dis like vodka, your basic sort of distilled liquor, out of literally anything. Potato peelings, um, spoiled grain, any old garbage you've got lying around. It's not going to taste great uh, if you do that, but because of the way it's distilled, it's still drinkable. It's still okay. It's not dangerous. And uh, you can't notice it as much. And if you take some of this cheap kind of rot gut vodka, and then you try to make it taste a little better by adding adding things like juniper berries and citrus rind and various other sort of aromatic things to make it to sort of cover the cheapness of it. What you get is gin. That's what gin is. And so in England, they started producing gin and selling it um, quite cheaply because you could make it out of any old garbage. And people started buying it and drinking it in larger and larger quantities because they couldn't get beer. Um, or they couldn't afford it. It was just more expensive. And so people started drinking gin instead of beer. And that could be really, really, really bad because instead of drinking small beer, which is relatively low alcohol, people are now drinking gin as a beverage, pouring themselves a glass of gin. And if you do that for any length of time, you are going to die. It's number one, very difficult to remain hydrated that way. And number two, it's people are... Think about the general conditions. Packed very tightly, lots of people living in a small space, they're working long, long hours, they're eating very little and their diet is very poor, they have very little in the way of sanitation or ability to um, basic hygiene, care and groom themselves, and they're also now super drunk. So it is a nightmare and this situation ends up being something that is uh, becomes the center of a lot of social reformers' um, anger and concern that drinking too much is causing all kinds of societal problems. One, it's destroying people's health. Two, it's causing social problems, like it's causing domestic violence and um, exacerbating fights between people and all kinds of other issues. And so this reference to gin in Chadwick's report is very deliberate. It's an effort to point out that a bad 
circumstance can lead to bad behavior, which of course none of us want. And he, when he presents this kind of report to Parliament, he uses this kind of technique to try to convince Parliament that laws have to be passed, that we have to nip this kind of terrible behavior in the bud. Anyway, he goes on and he talks about other conditions in the sweatshop and how people's health suffer and how they die young and how people are left um, widowed and orphaned and how it ends up costing the government money in the long run because of something that is a relatively easy fix. If you could simply uh, put into the coding laws that there have to be decent windows in workshops, then you could get around all of this. That's what Jed argues. He does the same thing uh, with his second example, which is about the living quarters for coal miners, where they talk about how they're living in this attic room where the roof leaks and everything is frozen in the winter and it's there's no kind of air and everybody's packed in together like sardines and how it, miserable it is and how dirty the bottom floors are. He goes on and on and if you read it, it's fairly clear. And so this is an excellent text to choose if you wanted to talk about conditions for the working poor and what people are sort of struggling with. Okay, so that's Chadwick. Okay, along the same lines, I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but we have Friedrich Engels, uh, Inquiry into the Condition of the Working Class in England in 1845. He's famous, and I've shown you a picture, I found a picture here of him, about as old as he would have been when he wrote this. He was about 22 to 24 years old uh, when he wrote this text. Um, while he was visiting England, he was inspired, he lived in Manchester. And it's an examination of what it's like for the working class. And Engels is in no way um, cutting anybody any slack. He goes on in great detail about what life is like. And he uses this very kind of moving prose. I'm not going to uh, go into too many quotes. It's fairly, his writing is fairly clear and straightforward. Um, he gets into a lot of really strong details about how the poor live without any kind of decent clothes and any kind of decent food, any kind of decent living conditions, and this air that's unbreathable, and this water that's undrinkable, and it's just all horrible and terrible, and they live like animals. And then he is going to do the same kind of thing that Chadwick did, where he uh, does these examples that he's given, where he talks about how he has like a friend of a friend who told the story, and that's where he heard it, and this is where he lives. And he it relates this story that the friend of a friend told. And in it, he builds up this whole like scenario where he talks about how um, his friend is he living in this like basement apartment and he's miserable and they're struggling and they're poor and he's part of this family and the friend is crying big fat tears because he can't find any work and there's no work for any men anywhere and his wife is in the factory all day long and she can't care for the children so this man has to stay home and care for the children and cook and clean and it's horrible and he hates his life and he's crying big tears and isn't this unnatural and as you're reading it, you think, oh, I see where Engels is going with this. He is talking about how horrible this situation is. He is complaining about the unnatural position of the sexes where women are working and men are stuck at home caring for children. And isn't that terrible? And you think you know where he's going. But then at the end, this is the best part of Condition of the Working Class in England. At the end, he pulls this like presto change of switcheroo. And he's... Uh, more or less lays it out. So you have to pay careful attention toward the last few paragraphs of the selection where he had set up this whole story and then at the end he's like, but wait, if you think, dear reader, that it was terrible and oppressive and horrible that this man has to stay home and do all this cooking and cleaning and just worry about his wife possibly losing her job and then they'll all throw him on the street and starve, if you think that's terrible, well then that just proves that the traditional way we've done things, where it's the woman who has to stay at home and cook and clean while the man goes out and earns money, was always wrong in the first place. That if it's wrong for women to work and men to have to stay at home and you know be dependent, then it was always wrong in the first place for men to work and women to have to stay at home and be dependent too. So Engels is really laying it out there. It's a radical idea. It's going to dovetail really nicely with his much more famous text that you've probably heard of, a co-authored piece with his friend Karl Marx when they write the Communist Manifesto, which we'll talk about in just a bit. Okay, so this text, in case you're looking for it, 
Um, in some editions of Kishlansky, it is in the text, it's in the book, check your table of contents. In some, it isn't. And so in case you have a book that doesn't have it, I did add it to Blackboard, and you can go to Blackboard under content, and you'll see that it's there. Okay, so the next uh, selection is kind of a twofer. Uh, we have Alexis Sawyer's Modern Housewife and Isabella Beaton's Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management. Uh, that's on 152 of your my Kishlansky book. It's probably the same in yours, but just in case, uh, you can check the table of contents. Um, it's really kind of two, one stacked on another, and they're similar in some ways. The first, Modern Housewife, uh, is meant to be a handbook for how to manage your household as a middle-class housewife of the 19th century. It's meant to be kind of to be a model of the behavior that a middle-class housewife would exhibit. And in England, and this was marketed primarily for English-speaking audiences, although Alexis Sawyer was French, she was a French chef, and he had a very exciting life. Um, but both of these texts are kind of marketed to the middle-class English-speaking uh, housewife, if you will. But when I say middle class, I want to emphasize we're talking about the old fashioned definition of middle class, the bourgeois, people who have uh, their own house, their own household, their own money, people who are wealthy enough to have servants. And you don't have to be terribly wealthy in the 19th century to have servants, but we're not talking about people who are poor here. Uh, we're talking about people who are reasonably well to do. And in the 19th century, as part of that social backlash, we saw it with Napoleon rolling back all of those rights and rules uh, for women uh, and making it much more legally uh, restrictive again in France. The same kind of thing happens in England. And it, to some extent, it, it didn't change as much as violently, but the same conditions sort of apply in the Americas as well, uh, where uh, there's this new and renewed emphasis on traditional roles for men and women. And the women's movement that was part of the French Revolution is kind of rejected by a lot of sort of mainstream uh, forces in society. It doesn't ever entirely go away. There's a women's suffrage movement, there are women's rights movements in Europe as well as in England and the Americas, but those movements are going to suffer and struggle as a result of the kind of negative backlash from the French Revolution. And you also get this real anxiety on the part of middle classes and upper classes to try to re-establish their place as kind of better than the common nasty herds of horrible revolutionary radicals. So they're going to end up, uh, I guess, out of almost anxiety, becoming more conservative than people ever had been before, socially speaking. And so you get these handbooks of proper behavior, really guide, sort of designed and aimed at this middle class that wants to show that their manners and behavior reflect a very proper, uh, very, uh, I guess, socially conscious and social climbing kind of outlook and attitude. So you get these handbooks, they end up selling like hotcakes because everybody wants to show that they're classy. So in Modern Housewife, um, you have Alexis Sawyer and it's presented as a dialogue between a couple of imaginary people. And it talks specifically about um, managing servants. And this is what a part of what a middle class woman would expect to be her job. And again, it illustrates the kind of social disparity that even people who are consider themselves in the middle, socially speaking, are, are managing whole uh, like a staffs of people because labor is so, so cheap. And it also gives a few clues in there as it describes what uh, life is like. It gives wonderful clues as to how they get up and what they do and how they organize um, things and what their breakfast is all about um, and how the children are raised. And it describes how children are more or less raised by governesses and, um, and nurses, etc., and spend relatively little time with their children. Um, and it also goes on to talk about how um, women are expected to kind of run the ship as managers, but also to make sure that everything is available and ready and run their kind of husband's social calendar, and that is what they do. Now, uh, there's one little note I just wanted to point out. There's a specific uh, effort on page 143 to point out that 
in this ideal woman's life and situation, uh, she describes how there is a larder, which is uh, basically a pantry where you keep uh, like ham and various other sort of semi-perishable, it's a cool space, uh, but where you'd keep like meat and various other kinds of expensive items that are food items. And she describes how they keep a larder and it uh, occupies about half the thing. And then she goes over what's in it. She makes a list and then uh, checks that list against what's there. Like she does inventory of the food that's in her house. And she also describes how only the cook and the, the housewife have the keys that she doesn't make, leave the larder unlocked and she doesn't leave the keys to it in the hands of just any of her servants. It's only in the hands of herself and her cook. And Sawyer emphasizes the importance of this as a proper management technique. And what it does, it's one of those little clues that tells you so much more than the author ever intended. What it does really point out actually is just what the situation was like for servants in one of these houses. Now, the employment conditions are dire. People are desperate for work. They're desperate for any kind of a job. And when they're hired to work as servants in somebody's house, very frequently their wages are extremely low. They also work very long hours where they would be given maybe half a day off per week was standard uh, in 1850. Uh, so people are working very long hours for very low wages. They live in a household, but they also know that there is a line around the block for people who would replace them in a heartbeat if they get fired. They also know that if they get fired without a reference, uh, they are out on their ear in the street. They're never going to get hired for anything else. They're not going to get a job in the factory. They're not going to get a job as a servant for anybody else. They are going to likely turn to prostitution or crime or starve to death, and that's going to be their life. So people in that kind of dangerous, precarious position are nevertheless still in a situation where they have to be locked out of the pantry, that you have to put, uh, have to keep track of who has the keys to where you store your food in a household. What that strongly suggests is just how desperate things are. Even if you have a job, even if you're in one of these houses, uh, the suspicion is, the expectation is that despite what the potential consequences are, that your servants are likely to steal food from you. And the not only does this reflect that people are concerned about that happening, so food obviously is more costly perhaps than it is today, but also it reflects just what the reality is. Somebody who would lose their job for stealing and still steal food can really only be motivated by one thing. The servants, even these fully employed servants living in a household, are hungry. Like, that is a thing to consider. Okay, anyway, so hopping from Alexis Sawyer, who didn't intend to address that issue, but gives us a clue to it, we're going to hop on over to Isabella Beaton, in which she is going to talk about the um, Mrs. Beaton's book of household management, and she's going to talk also about what it means to be a great housewife and what it is you should be like. And she's going to go on and on. Um, and she's going to quote some things. And it's, again, fairly uh, strong language, colorful language, where she talks about the essential nature of woman and how her um, among the gifts that nature has bestowed on women, this is 154 in my book, uh, few rank higher than the capacity for domestic management, where the exercise of this faculty constantly affects the happiness, comfort, and prosperity of the whole family. In this opinion, we were borne out by the author of The Vicar of Wakefield, who says the modest virgin, the prudent wife, and the careful matron are much more serviceable in life than petticoated philosophers, blustering heroines, or virago queens. She's here presenting a direct contrast to the women's movement, people who are arguing that women should have the right to vote, that women should have the right to uh, go to uh, institutions of higher education, that women should have legal rights and protections. Beaton is arguing that there is kind of a natural place for women and it is running the household and that's what she's supposed to do. Uh, and then she talks about what you should be like and how you should care about cleanliness and you should be uh, in, she, basically um, the model sort of person. And then just as a quick, I'm not going to get into all the details of it. Again, her writing is nice and clear. So uh, if you're interested, you, I'm sure we'll have no trouble with it. Uh, but 
I just want to emphasize that in this text, Beaton is trying to present the image of the ideal wife as in this almost impossible compromise position, uh, where on, say, on page um, 155, economy and frugality must never be allowed to degenerate into meanness. So you have to be frugal, but you're not allowed to be cheap. Hospitality should be practiced, but care must be taken that the love of company for its own sake does not become a prevailing passion. Such a habit is no longer hospitality, but dissipation. So you have to be hospitable and hostess people in your home, but you shouldn't do that for its own sake because then it's uh, indulgence. Then, a lady, when she first undertakes responsibility of a household, she should not attempt to retain all the mere acquaintances of her youth. Her true and tried friends are treasures never to be lightly lost, but they and the friends she will make by entering her husband's circle, and very likely by moving to a new locality, should provide her with ample society. So don't try to keep all your friends. Instead, make friends with some of your husband's circle, etc. Um, but you should still keep your friends. It's a contradictory kind of uh, practice where it's trying to aim for an incredibly small little ideal spot. In conversation, one should never dwell unduly on petty annoyances and trivial disappointments of the day. Many people get into the bad habit of talking incessantly of the worries of their servants and children, not realizing that to many of their hearers, these are uninteresting, if not wearisome subjects. From one's own point of view, it is well not to start on a topic which, without having sufficient knowledge to discuss it with intelligence. Important events, whether of joy or sorrow, should be told to friends whose sympathy or congratulation may be welcome. A wife should never allow a word about any faults of her husband to pass her lips. So on the subject of what women should talk about, don't talk about things you don't know about. But if you're a good housewife, what do you know about your household, your children, your servants, I guess. Right. But don't talk about them. So it really leaves a very narrow field. You're not supposed to talk about things really outside the home because you don't really have any expertise there. And you're not really talking about things inside your home because it's boring to people. And above all things, you should never say anything bad about your husband ever. Okay. <laughs> and then it talks about cheerfulness and how important it is to be cheerful and keep everybody happy. And, uh, and then she gets into dress and fashion and how you have to follow the fashions but not be a slave to fashion and uh, she also goes on about how you should be careful and your dress should reflect well on your family and yet you shouldn't spend too much money on it over and over in isabella beaton's book of household management what she describes here for this ideal housewife this ideal middle class woman is this almost impossible balancing act um, it's, it's a goal that is in many ways unrealistic, even just as she explains what you're supposed to be like. It's difficult. It's, I guess there is a way to be completely moderate, completely in the middle, completely on that perfect, hit that perfect note where you're uh, well-dressed, but you haven't spent a lot of time or money on it. I don't know. But uh, it really reflects something that is a phenomenon worth noting at the 19th century. There's a tremendous amount driven by this social anxiety we we're talking about that is rejecting the women's movement and uh, women's liberation and women's suffrage and all that kind of thing. There's this kind of counteracting push to keep women in an increasingly restricted social and political and economic role. Okay. So famously, we have next on the list, Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto, 1848, in which, and you can probably find, I imagine you may not have, uh, this may not be the first time you've read uh, the Communist Manifesto. It's all over everywhere. You used to be able to get it for a dollar from any college bookstore, uh, but I'm sure you can get it online for free now. In 1848, Engels and Marx worked together to collaborate. It's mostly Marx's work, honestly to sit down and write what it is that communists believe. And as you can probably guess, this is part of an era of increasingly radical philosophical thought. Um, there are others, we'll talk about them in lecture, like uh, Pierre Proudhon, etc., who flirt with these ideas. There are others who are flirting with the ideas of socialism one way or another. But in the Communist Manifesto, it's meant to be a description and uh, kind of an announcement, pronouncement of what it is to be a communist, what communists believe, and what it is that they want to happen. And 
it is relatively straightforward to read. Uh, it does express some really, uh, for their time, um, I guess, uh, popular, but at the same time, radical ideas. It talks about all of history being really a struggle between the working class and the owning class, the bourgeoisie or the people who own stuff. And this would include everyone from the middle class, like uh, shopkeepers, factory owners, all the way up to kings and people at the top. Everyone's kind of glomped in together there. And then contrasting that with the proletariat, the working class, people who work for a living and actually produce stuff. And in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels talk about how all of everything, no matter what it looks like on the surface, is really a struggle between working class people to get decent living conditions, to get decent, um, I guess, prosperity, decent security against the owning class of people who want to get the most wealth, the most privilege, the most profit out of this system as they possibly can and keep the working class from getting their fair share. So. Uh, they talk about how this is the cycle of history. They talk about how everything from marriage to, um, well, you know, ownership of factories to everything is really part of this great class struggle. And that the only way forward is to break this cycle, to have a true revolution where the proletariat will rise up, overthrow the bourgeoisie once and for all, get rid of private property and get rid of all of the relics like marriage, for instance, that are put in place legally to reinforce private property. Um, and what Marx and Engels are not necessarily against monogamy, uh, but what they argue with marriage is that really it has nothing to do with relationships. Instead, it has to do with controlling property and using and uh, defining women as property, which the communists say is something we don't do. They go beyond the women's movement in terms of radical uh, reframing what it is, uh, what women's rights should be and say that women should have complete and total equality uh, legally and economically uh, and socially with men. Um, so uh, the Communist Manifesto puts forward these ideas and they express this desire for a violent overthrow, violent if necessary, uh, overthrow of basically all of the structures of society that have uh, up until this point uh, separated private ownership of things like industries and all that. Kind of, they're not saying people shouldn't have their own shoes, for instance, when they say that property is theft, like Proudhon. Uh, what they are arguing is that it is immoral and wrong and theft to argue, to own something like a factory where a hundred people work and you keep all the profits. Um, and they also argue that the current system is just set up to reinforce that notion. And so everything from education to marriage to, um, I guess, production of food has to be revolutionized so that everybody contributes as best they can and everybody benefits equally from it. That's the Communist Manifesto. Okay, so now we have uh, J.A. Hobson's Imperialism from 1902. Moving forward a little bit in time, uh, Hobson is one of the more influential thinkers on the notion of imperialism and colonialism in the late part of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And he's one that's going to buck a trend. We really haven't seen too much of this idea expressed up until now. Hobson's going to argue that imperialism is a bad thing. So his writing is a little bit dense, uh, but it's relatively clear. His language is fairly clear. Um, in which he argues that Imperialism, the drive to create an empire out of a bunch of uh, conquered or colonized uh, territories around the world, is presented in the British uh, kind of national dialogue as a positive thing, a way for Britain to become rich, as a way for Britain to become powerful, and as a good thing that we ought to do. But Hobson argues, in fact, that's wrong, that imperialism doesn't benefit most people. Uh, in Britain. In fact, uh, the working classes are probably harmed by it, if anything. Uh, who it benefits is a very small class of people who are in a position to turn a profit, people who are the land grabbers who are going to South Africa, for instance, and grabbing up land and uh, staking claims on diamond mines, etc. People who are uh, looking for ways to make uh, a profit, as there certainly is profit to be made. They're making a fortune, but Britain itself, not really. 
Instead, Britain's getting put on the hook every time one of these opportunists trying to make themselves rich goes in and establishes um, a claim somewhere and gets into trouble. Uh, they send letters back home and it begins screaming and then the British uh, government has to send the army and the navy to defend their claims, whether they have any real actual right to be doing what they're doing or not. In fact, Offsen argues they really don't have any right to be doing what they're doing. They're just making nuisances of themselves for their own private gain. And yet we, the British public, have to pay to support them. And it really is a bad thing for Britain. Um, there's a series of, of places in our text. In my book, it's page 217, is where the text begins. And um, he explains, put into plain language, the theory is this. Any British subject choosing for his own private pleasure or profit to venture his person or his property in the territory of a foreign state can call upon this nation to protect or avenge him in case he or his property is injured either by the government or by any inhabitant of this foreign state. This is a perilous doctrine. It places the entire military, political, and financial resources of this nation at the beck and call of any missionary society which considers it has a peculiar duty to attack the religious sentiments or observances of some savage people or of some reckless explorer who choose just those spots of the earth known to be inhabited by hostile peoples, ignorant of British power, the speculative trader or mining prospector gravitates naturally towards dangerous and unexplored countries where the gains of a successful venture will be quick and large. All of these men, missionaries, travelers, sportsmen, scientists, traders, in no proper sense the accredited representatives of this country, uh, but actuated by private personal motives, are at liberty to call upon the British nation to spend millions of money and thousands of lives to defend them against risks which the nation has not sanctioned. So Hobson argues, in if I were to put that very simply or more succinctly, that What's happening is that the British government and the British people who will end up supporting that government, either through tax money or through military service, are ending up as servants at the beck and call of profiteers who are just deliberately causing problems in order to uh, make themselves rich. And that it's generally a bad and immoral practice to pursue imperialism. Um, the quote I've put up here is toward the back end of our text. It's a depraved choice of national life imposed by self-seeking interests which appeal to the lusts of quantitative acquisitiveness and forceful domination surviving in a nation from early centuries of the animal struggle for existence. Hobson argues basically that imperialism is incompatible with the better qualities of civilized life. Okay, we'll contrast that with... Cecil Rhodes. Now, Rhodes is one of the more, uh, I personally find it fun, texts that we have for the semester. He's one of those love to hate him kind of guys. He is as bald faced and unapologetic racist as you are ever going to read. He just sees nothing wrong with his sentiments. And uh, he's not, well, we'll talk about his particular type of racism in just a minute. But um, it's very difficult to put a, a pleasant face on it, I can say that. Cecil Rhodes is uh, very, he was a very active uh, person in the 19th century. Uh, he writes his Confession of Faith in 1877, where he is trying to explain what it is he believes about stuff. And so he lays it all on out there, which is our text from uh, R.K. Shalansky book, page 220 in my book. And uh, what Cecil Rhodes was famous for, he lives a lot of his life in Africa where he kind of goes from place to place. He's a land grabber. He's one of those people who grabs up diamond mines and tries to make a profit on that. He uh, ends up in get embroiled in all kinds of adventures. And the end of his life, he's very, very wealthy as a result of this. And he does exactly what Hobson just complained about in imperialism. He uh, ventures into things looking for his own profit and ultimately is going to reap his own on profit. But at the same time, every time he gets into trouble, it's the British army that has to come in and bail him out. And he keeps going in as this provocateur over and over and over again, causing problems and just blustering around, uh, grabbing up everything he can see. And in his confession of faith, he just explains why he thinks this is a great way to live. And he talks about what he sees as the destiny of Britain. And 
in so doing, he's got beautifully quotable quotes in there. He's great for writing a paper. I contend that we, and by that he means the British, are the finest race in the world, and the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. He really does mean this. Now, one of the things you might notice about Cecil Rhodes is that his definition of race is a bit different from one we might use in the U.S. today. He sees it as uh, as much cultural as it is biological. So he's flirting with ideas of biological racism, and I don't mean to, to say that he has none of them. But those ideas are really going to be developed in the 20th century. It's the very tail end, very tail end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s where you see this uh, sort of biological notion of race emerge in a fully developed way. And Cecil Rhodes is playing with it when it really still hasn't quite come out, where he sees races as uh, race as much almost as an ethnicity as anything else. But that being said, he strongly believes that the British are the best people in the world. Um, you can see his kind of odd from perhaps our perspective notion of race when he talks about the Americas and how losing the U.S. was a terrible blow to the British uh, because one of the problems that England has, in his view, is they don't have enough space for British people to live in. And so uh, people might uh, not be having more children that they could have had if there was more room for them. I mean, this is classic racist ideology. And he complains about losing the Americas and the American colonies because think of those, and I'm quoting here from 221, countless thousands of Englishmen that during the last hundred years would have crossed the Atlantic and settled and populated the United States. Would they not have made without any prejudice a finer country of it than the low-class Irish and German immigrants? All we have lost and the country loses owing to whom? Owing to two or three ignorant pig-headed statesmen of the last century. He goes on and rants about the United States for a while. And here he clearly lays out that he considers the Irish and the English to be different races. And the Irish and the Germans to be a different race from the English. So you can see it's, it's at least, uh, it's not quite the way we would define race. But nevertheless, some of the elements that we associate with uh, late 20th century racist ideology, the idea that we're in some kind of a competition to kind of outbreed our rivals, that we should have space for the best kind of people in the world, and that some people are fundamentally superior to others, uh, and that it would benefit the world to be under the rule and command of the finest race in the world, the British, as Cecil Rhodes sees it. This is as classic and as clear and as quotable an example of this uh, early 20th century, late 19th century racist ideology as you're ever going to find. So Cecil Rhodes ends up being just a delight. If you're looking for somebody you love to hate, and he's great to quote for a paper, um, uh, talking about this kind of pro-colonialist attitude. Cecil Rhodes, it probably goes without saying, is a strong proponent of the, the scramble for Africa, of grabbing up land around the world, ruling it outright from the British Empire. He is a strong defender of the notion of the British Empire. His ideas were, and this kind of goes for Hobson as well, both Hobson and Rhodes were relatively mainstream. They could say what they thought without really being like run out of town. Cecil Rhodes was on the extreme end, perhaps, of his views, but his were considered acceptable. He could say them in public. He could admit to them. You could admit to agreeing with Cecil Rhodes in 1877 and not get like kicked out of your, uh, I don't know, flower arranging society or something. This were considered polite sentiments, things that reasonable people might think. On the flip side, Hobson's views that imperialism was a bad idea um, certainly had its detractors. People like Rhodes would uh, call Hobson a traitor and yell at them and they'd be back and forth with each other. But it also was an acceptable view. There were always people on both sides of the fence, but both sides of the fence were considered socially acceptable uh, in the 19th century and into the 20th century. So that's worth knowing. Okay, so that's it for this reading roundup. Thanks a lot.